So, concerning uh, Buddhism, which we kind of found our way to, or we're investigating, um, the, in a way, Buddhism uh, is concerned with the, the principal questions that human beings have always been concerned with, I suppose, which are, you know, what, what must I do to be happy? What are the sources of happiness? What is the way to become free from, from suffering? And these are the age-old simple questions of, of, of being alive, really, that confront us in, in being alive. And Buddhism really is concerned with this. Those are the questions that Buddha asked himself, it seems, uh, that prompted him to set out on his own kind of journey, um, spiritual discovery. And in a way, they they prompted us to to at least uh, make some kind of investigation of Buddhism, and perhaps even commit ourselves to its to its to its practice. Of course, in the there are many recipes on or many many potential answers to the, these these questions, these fundamental human questions, uh, on offer today as they always as always have been. Um, I mean, if for some, of course, the answer to these questions is, is to be found in uh, changing the external world by various means, whether uh, technological means for transforming uh, the kind of surroundings and perhaps even tr transforming human beings, political action to transform social arrangements and, and so on and so forth. And uh, they they they're on offer, very strongly on offer, in fact, in the in the in the modern world. And then other other things that we might consider as a way to answer these questions, of course, are found in philosophies and and religions, which, of course, in comparison to say the answers from technology and politics, uh, suggest there's something. There's an inner dimension to human life which cannot be kind of satisfactorily dealt, explained, uh, satisfactorily dealt with, uh, merely by physical means, whether political or, or scientific or technical. All religions, most philosophies, agree with that. But of course, then we find that there are differences within that, those things, as we've seen for ourselves, that generally most religions suggest that the means of happiness is to 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 develop a relationship with with a, with an external being with a, with a god perhaps the creator god himself and that by that means that we uh, we will find a way to well salvation to 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 freedom in 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 some way to eternal life and so on and so forth um but of course, Buddhism doesn't see it quite that way either, because uh, Buddhism sees that, in fact, the the source of happiness and suffering is actually the mind. Right? The mind, is, uh, in the sense of the, the not just the, the, the intellectual aspect of mind, but the emotional aspect of mind. So, for Buddhism, uh, it, it is this which is really where we need to place our attention. That it is only in the, the, the mind or the heart that you can really unravel the causes of, of, of suffering. Because no matter how we change the external world, we still find that we're oppressed by, by various kinds of, of sufferings. Um, no matter what physical changes we make, uh, we, still, uh, we still find we're oppressed by, by dissatisfaction, disappointment, disillusion and suffering. And of course, also by by that, that kind of a graphic illustration of suffering, which is uh, impermanence, old age, and 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 death. So, for Buddhism, 
it is really the mind that is the king of creators. If we're looking for a creator, for Buddhism, it's the mind which is the creator, the creator of, of, of suffering and happiness. That the, the mind right now, uh, as Buddha pointed out, the mind of all beings is, is kind of fundamentally pure, fundamental, primordially, in its natural state. It has the capacity for, for, for wisdom and compassion, which are the, the true roots of happiness. But from beginning this time, we've been acting in ignorance of that fundamental nature of our mind and uh, perpetuated a, a mistaken understanding of the world and of who we and of who we are. And this, this fiction that we're propagating from day to day, from moment to moment, about the nature of ourselves and the, and the world, that is the real cause of suffering. Because we're contending with the actual nature of the world. We are, we, we are, we are living in a fantasy, but the reality is not changed by our fantasy. Reality is the same as it's always been. Things arise, things pass away. The world is not under our control. It is not something subject to our desires or our hatreds. The world is what it is. And we are fighting with it due to our, our misperception of, of, of our nature and of the nature of the world. So that this requires not some... To, to put this right, to put our uh, the cause of suffering right in us, the cause of suffering which are... This, our misperceptions, our ignorance, and the disturbing emotions of hatred and desire so on that arise from that, to put all that right, it can't be done by external means, by changing the external world, or by changing the physical arrangement of things. It has to be something that occurs in our heart. And that is what Lord Buddha points to when he says that it is mind that is the source of happiness and 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 suffering, uh, and in fact, as he as he put it, actually everybody everybody is already in a way endowed with the capacity to awaken to 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 be a being of, of limitless compassion and wisdom, as exemplified by by him and and, and other enlightened beings. Um, it's already present, but it needs uncovering. Uh, it's as if our fundamental nature, our primordial pure nature, our Buddha nature, to use that term, is encrusted by lifetimes of, of negativity, lifetimes of disturbing emotions, of ignorance, of karmic actions. So it's like a, a, a complete, completely encrusted jewel which nobody uh, can see, but it is present, uh, nevertheless, and has not been diminished or tarnished in any way by the surrounding incrustations. That is what Buddha means when he says that that you have the the the, the, the Buddha nature. Or as again as it's, we could say, all beings are actually already in a way Buddhas, but they just simply do not know it. So the 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 the, the path of Buddhism, all the fantastically rich and, uh, teachings of Buddhism on ethics, on meditation on philosophy and, and the, the, the kind of things that, that supplement these fundamental aspects of the path like ritual and art and all the rest really all come down to that just the means of, 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 of stripping the, the encrustations of our bad habits bad emotional habits ignorance and so on away from the jewel of our Buddha nature mind so, in that sense, Buddhism is extraordinarily simple. It, it, it is just that. Recognizing that, the, 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 that everything we need is, is already present and un uncovering it. Why then are the teachings of the Buddha extraordinarily rich, one might even say sometimes very intimidatingly rich and, and varied, if what is necessary, what we need is already present within each of us. And the answer for that is that that it's the encrustation <laughs> that covers our Buddha nature. Each each encrustation is somewhat different. We we have accumulated different kind of 
habits along the along the way. We have different strengths and different weaknesses. Our disturbing emotions have particular configurations. For some people, hatred is the strongest disturbing emotion. For others, it's 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 greed. For others, again, it's jealousy, and so on and so forth. So. Although the matter at hand, the real matter, is extraordinarily simple uh, uh, and one might say almost universal, uh, the Buddha nature is not better in anybody than anybody else, it's the Buddha nature, what surrounds it, what surrounds it is different. And hence, Buddha presented his teachings so that beings could approach it from whatever their particular starting point was, the starting point, which is none other than the incrustations. In a way, you see, what prompts us to seek out Dharma is the fact that we've become, we find there's something out of alignment in our lives. It's our habits, it's our disturbing emotions. In fact, in a peculiar and ironically wonderful way, it's our neurosis that makes us seek wisdom. Um, we, we are discontent, we become discontented. Things are out of alignment, things don't quite fit. Our set, our attitude to the world is, is so rigid, is so tight, that it produces unease and discomfort, suffering. So that's what we start from. And everybody's mix of disturbing emotions and suffering is somewhat, is somewhat different. And that's why Buddha, with his kind of extraordinary flexibility, uh, presented the teachings in many, many different kinds of, of ways to meet where so many different types of people were coming from. And then when you add to that the difference from, uh, you know, occasion by geography and culture and history, then we see that, that although the, the matter of Dharma, the kind of core matter, is, is extraordinarily simple, the means to get to it, to uncover it, to free it, have to be various because you know everybody everybody's as a karmic mix is somewhat is somewhat different sure the the commonalities as i indicated some people are more driven by aggression some more by desire and so on and so forth um that's true uh, and some people's kind of philosophical misconceptions are more towards eternalism as we put it in buddhism and others towards nihilism so all these kind of uh, uh, exist, but they're com uh, these commonalities exist, these groupings among beings, uh, potential practitioners exist. So Buddha presented the teachings in, in, in we say really he presented 84,000 different teachings. I mean, of course, it's a suspiciously round number, but it indicates it's the, ex the kind of the, the flexibility and the variety of ways of presenting the Dharma. And each of those 84 different, 84,000 different teachings is like a door, a door to liberation, a door going from our present state of confusion, frustration, disappointment, disillusion, and again and again. But now there's a door from that world, from samsaric world, from our fictional world, to the, the real, the real, to the, to the true, to the ultimate reality, which is none other than the timeless, unborn, unceasing nature of mind it, itself, which when it recognized, there is complete bliss, because all causes of suffering, of dissatisfaction, have come to an end, since the fiction that underlies them has been cut through. The fiction of here is the self, and there is the other. Because it's that fundamental split that we make in the world to affirm this illusory self by distinguishing it from the illusory other that is the source of all our disturbing emotions, all karma, and hence all suffering. And when we recognize that such a split is a fiction, when we recognize the true nature of reality, the true nature of mind, then all the things that have produced suffering have uh, produced suffering are themselves dissolved, and there is complete liberation from suffering, complete, full, fulfilment. Yet yeah, this 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 path to discover our Buddha nature 
and therefore to discover the true source of happiness, we should realize pretty quickly, if not immediately, that the happiness we're talking about can't be a happiness that is just a private happiness. can't be a happiness that just is something we seek for ourselves alone. Because I, I'm one being among countless beings. And in fact, my very existence as this one being is dependent on and contingent upon all the other beings, most dramatically, obviously, uh, most evidently in this life upon my parents and family, but finally, in a way, among the, on the whole family of sentient beings. My existence is, is part of that, of, that, of, that, of that network of, of, of beings, of, of embodied beings, of living beings. So I cannot actually uh, uh, journey towards the source of happiness without considering other beings. So my, my search for the causes of, to uncover and dissolve the causes of suffering must be one that I undertake for all and not for, my, for myself alone. Because a journey undertaken for the sake of self alone isn't actually going to dissolve the fiction of self. It's just going to, in a sort of way, reinforce it. So that's pretty clear from the get-go in Dharma that the, the, the journey to liberation must be one that is motivated by compassion for others, not simply by distress at one's own individual suffering. Uh, but it, it must be one that, that encompasses the needs of, of others. And in doing so, of course, we'll be emulating the, the example of the Buddha, who, who as, as the stories say, was first motivated to set out on the path um, by confronting the awful suffering experienced by another. Uh, that his, his response to that, that, that awful suffering being inflicted on another being, as it were, awoke his natural uh, potential for enlightenment through kindness, through, through, through compassion, through putting aside his own self-interest and taking on the needs of another. So, again, from the get-go in Dharma, we, we, must be, we must be clear about that, that we're in the business of happiness, yes, but it is not a happiness of my own self-content, privileging myself and my own needs, escaping to some kind of private, private nirvana. It, it is the happiness of all that we're concerned with. And, of course, that happiness is not the happiness of kind of, me, of, of forgetfulness that you get from kind of temporary, temporary pleasures, temporary physical pleasures or, or, or so on and so forth. It is a happiness that is, is not based upon such temporary causes, but upon the fulfillment of one's potential and helping other beings to fulfill their potential for Buddhahood. So, although we can say Buddhism is about, about happiness, it's a happiness that is contingent on wisdom and compassion, not on mere escapism, or not on mere, for instance, in the practice of meditation. We practice meditation because that is a vital part of uncovering the Buddha nature. But the, medita the, pra the purpose of meditation is not to tranquilize ourselves to the temporary difficulties of life but in fact to uncover to create a basis for uncovering the true nature of mind so again we say buddhism is about happiness but it is not about the the happiness of the of, of some kind of uh, industry of spreading kind of temporary tranquilization by some kind of purloined meditation techniques Happiness must, uh, and true happiness can only exist in, in the presence of authentic wisdom and and compassion. So it is nothing to do with the kind of uh, the, the happiness promoted by a kind of consumer society or, or whatever that we see so so much nowadays. I just want to to make that that clear because sometimes you know it, 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 by saying Buddhism is about happiness, one one runs the risk of turning Buddhism into some, as I say, something very trivial and very banal. But the happiness that Lord Buddha is talking about is this happiness, the happiness of, uh, of, of working for the liberation of all beings and, and in, in that way dissolving your sense of your, your egotism, your self-clinging, which 
is the cause of real suffering. So that is, in a way, how we, I think, should should kind of understand the Dharma. Of course, we grow towards this. Um, it, it, it's not that there's an, as it were, there's a demand that you must have understood and signed on to the whole of Dharma before you can even make any beginnings. You, we have to make our first steps in Dharma often, well, almost always, of course, knowing some things and not knowing others, knowing that the initial steps make sense, and we can use the, and we can use those, and the the deeper, more profound stuff that we we might know is there, or we might have heard is there, or might guess is there. We'll get to that and deal with it in due in due course, because that's another thing, because the encrustation is so thick, it's many layers. And, and we have to work through it, most of us, gradually, uncovering one knot, one neurosis, one problem at a time. And then, then the next one comes up and we free ourselves from that. So this is why Buddhism is, is graduated. It's, it's a step-by-step -step thing. Even though the ultimate matter, the Buddha nature, is, is there. And if we had extraordinarily great circumstances, we could perhaps realize it all at once. And that would be it, that the path will be over. But for most of us, the path is a step by step, day by day, whole life, perhaps more than one life, affair in, in, in uncovering this, this extraordinary, extraordinary jewel. So that's what I want to say that, you know, in a way, we should get a, an overview of the Dhamma, what it's for, uh, but then realize, well, yes, but I'm just a kind of, you know, I need to start here and now, in my everyday life, in, in, in my circumstances, and just get it going. And hear the Dharma, think about the Dharma, meditate, hear, think, meditate, in other words, uh, beginning as, in the simplest way, and gradually, gradually, th this kind of wisdom and, and kindness and compassion, the qualities of the path, will, will, grow, in, will grow in me. Um, it's very important, I think, for us, uh, as uh, as as uh, newcomers to Dharma, so to speak, to realize that the that the we don't need to become extraordinary. We we don't need to how to put it. Um, we don't need some big kind of dramatic thing uh, running off to the caves or or, or anything like that. Um, that would be, in a way, probably a kind of fantasy uh, like a version of of the spiritual of the spiritual path. Um, much better to 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 practice the Dharma in the circumstances of our life. For most of us, that is the is that that is the case. That as a mother, a father, uh, a child, a, a worker, whatever it is, it's probably right there in that kind of life. As long as we can create enough time for study and practice that the Dharma will work most effectively for us. We don't need to, 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 to run away from that, hoping that if we run to some idealized kind of spiritual world, we'll be able to make progress. Actually, we'll have delayed our progress most uh, often by doing that. Because the circumstances of our life provide us enough material enough material for developing kindness, for developing concern and compassion to others, for developing patience, and so on. All these are extraordinarily important qualities that we'll need for the path. And if we approach our ordinary life in a proper way, with attentiveness and respect to it, and the people in it, then the, the Dharma qualities that we're trying to grow, and we're reading about and thinking about, I think will really, will really grow. Whereas if we think we have to, as I say, you know, rush off to some exotic location and, and, and so on and so forth, we're putting off the real encounter with what, what matters, which is this, the heart. Here is where the real work will be, will be done. And everyday life and our uh, network of relationships provides enough stimulus to open this heart if, if as I say, we're, we're respectful and attentive to the contours of everyday life.